It's not every day you get to introduce a baboon who lists his place of residence as Baboon Rock. But Richard Heitner is the founder of creative management consultancy Beta Baboon. He's also known to many of us in other guises. He was the deputy chairman of Saatchi and Saatchi worldwide. He's an adjunct professor of marketing here at LBS. He's the author of the book that you all have in your packs. But today I'm hoping he's going to tell us a little bit more about his creative <coughs> consultancy and what it is about life in the baboon troop that he thinks we can all learn from. Thank you very much, Alison. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, we've gone from bite-sized insights to bite-sized speakers, and uh, I apologise for that. Um, hopefully you'll get more than a bite-sized lunch. I love being back in the company of Sloan's. We've already had this morning uh, paradox to reconcile. We've had challenges laid at our door. We've had learning aplenty. I've already learned, for example, uh, not to CC anybody on an email if you want to keep a job. <laughs> Um, I've learned from Julian how not to introduce ourselves. So I thought I would just introduce myself today with uh, what I do. And I, I use creativity to help leaders land their best ideas. That's why I get up in the morning. That's why I'm here this morning, hopefully to help you land some of your ideas, doubtless stimulated by uh, lots of our speakers. That, uh, for me, started in the classroom in Sloan 2003. Uh, I'm delighted that the man who actually recommended I come on this programme in 2003 is at the back, Robin Hindle Fisher. Uh, so I owe you a lot. Uh, I owe Lyndon Selby even more because she let me on the programme with a truly <laughs> awful GMAT. Um, I owe uh, people like Julian a lot because he taught me, uh, as did Dominic Holder, who you will hear from this afternoon. He's going to host a panel debate. In fact, he was the guy who mentored me from Sloan through Saatchi and into uh, the faculty at London Business School. And of course, I owe a lot to uh, Andrew Lickerman. I worked with him using creativity to help him and his executive team land their best ideas for the school when it came to working on the school's purpose, its vision and values. And it took quite something for Sir Andrew to think differently as a management accountant because we confronted him with the need for more than simply what you do, but why we do it. Why do we do what we do at London Business School? And his, in the end, he gave blessing to this fantastic dream, in my view, of having a profound impact on the way the world does business. Not simply to have a profound impact on business, but the way it does business. And if you buy that, which I do hugely, I think that's exactly what the school's at at its best, that means that we have to think really differently. And how comfortable are we in thinking differently? How many of you would agree that creativity and innovation really matter? And you can answer not just because I'm speaking to it for the next half an hour, so you know I think it matters. I've seen a few hands go up. How many people? Yes? So you're kind of even more, you're over-indexing on, on this. Tell me why you think it matters. What's so important about creativity and innovation? Yeah, shout it out. We're in the Sloan, so nice and, nice and loud. Okay, so old norm we have to use our creativity and innovation. Other hands went up. Yes. So it's again back to the topic in the morning about everyone having access to information. Unless you're creative, you can't do differentiation anymore. Yeah. So, uh, I, I, and, and as Julian said, the innovation <laughs> takes two forms. How we work and also what it is we produce, what we, what we serve up, what we deliver. Any other reasons why it's just so important? Yeah. You're bored in your job, yeah. So you can take it to a personal level. And one more? Yeah. It's much more fun to solve a challenging problem. Absolutely. And the way you've defined it, it's much more fun to solve a problem uh, in, a, in, in a creative way. Yeah. And one more in front of you? Yeah. Creativity brings about emotion uh, and uh, stimulates um, connection. Okay. And, and we heard again from Julie, didn't we, that in, in the new norm, what we're looking to do is take decisive action based on emotional conviction. And unless we allow ourselves to think differently and to innovate, we're unlikely to do that. So 
Loud agreement in the room, help me then explain what on earth this is about. If it's that important, then how come, at least in Britain, and we are still part of the world, I think, <laughs> how come only 29% of British companies bother to put creativity and innovation on their list of recruitment criteria? Really, really important, better not hire for it. Why not? Yeah. Difficult to measure? Difficult to measure, yes. Say, uh, British culture is traditionally more risk averse than, say. Oh, okay, all right. So, for the Americans we're streaming in, it's an entirely British phenomenon. <laughs> we're hopelessly risk averse. Absolutely, yeah. Yes, sir. Because it mostly fails. It mostly fails, yeah. So, we can't measure it. We're risk averse. It mostly fails. Any other reason? It's hard to control. It's hard to control, yeah. So, so these are real obstacles. Which of the creative cultures you really admire when you think innovation? Which are the companies or organizations that come readily to mind? Google? Apple? Apple Ideo. Ideo. Any others? Tesla. Tesla, yeah. All these kind of groovy, groovy companies. And yet if we take our gentleman's definition at the back here of creativity as a way of solving problems, Actually, many more of us are more creative institutionally than we allow ourselves to believe. Toyota, who I've worked with uh, over many years, is probably the most creative company I've ever worked with. Why? Because they go to work every day to eliminate waste, to eliminate inefficiency, to continuously improve. So they actively seek out problems in order to think differently about how to overcome them. So... That's kind of institutionally where we are. When, I, when, I, when you make that personal to you now, one of you said it's just much more fun. You get a life if you come to work to create. But how many of you would say, I'm a really, not a really, I'm, I'm a creative person. How many people would put their hands up and say, I'm a crazy person? That's post Sloan. That is really good. Yeah. <laughs> but there's only half of you in the room. So those of you who didn't put your hands up, why not? I'm not a creative person. Tell us, tell us what, in, other than sheer modesty, what, why not? Anybody in the front? Yes. I guess I associate it with art. Aha. Uh -huh. uh, either you know, being able to paint or to sing or to play an instrument. I mean, because I can't do any of those. Yeah. I don't consider myself a creative person. And yet you just ran this simulation with five complete strangers <laughs> to act out, in effect, your business model. So, you know, that's a really interesting observation. Any other reasons why you might say you're not creative? Yes? I am right side of the brain analytical. Uh-huh. Yeah. yeah. So it belongs to the left brainers. You know, people like the little fella on stage, he must be creative because he comes from Saatchi and Saatchi and he must be left brain. Whereas, in fact, in my industry, probably the most creatively conservative industry, you have creative departments, and therefore, by definition, 60% of the workforce who are not deemed creative enough to have creative in their title. So we're all, we, we impose these constraints on ourselves. And Yes? I mean, I'm not creative because I, I think I don't have, like, brilliant ideas, like, you know, yeah. different ideas. Mm. Ah. And I'm not creative. Okay. So there's two, was... two big thoughts there. One is that because I'm not having huge, game-changing, brilliant ideas that has the, the world enraptured by their genius, I can't be creative. But then the second thing is I was creative. Once upon a time, I was really creative. You mentioned, uh, Nora, that you were creative at school. We all felt that. This is a guy, Sir Ken Robinson, a Brit, who talks about who talks about the British educational system drumming creativity out of us. And he talks about the kind of iniquity of this. He's got a, a fantastic TED talk. He's, he's created lots of literature around this. And he talks about this phenomenon, which I believe, by the way, is a global phenomenon, that mostly when our kids go through school, there comes a point in time where we're not interested in their essays anymore, their creative writing, their art their music, their drama. What we're interested in is whether they can find the right answer to the question. We don't even give them that much credit for the working out in the margin. And in fact, 
What Sir Ken Robinson says about us losing our confidence over time is borne out by the work I do with leaders right across the world, across many categories, where the leaders themselves have lost real confidence in their ability to think differently and to create. And that's a very, very curious thing. They've kind of got voices in their head that deny them the chance to do that. We've, uh, we need some uh, volume on this one, please. Nice and loud. It's the boss. So what are you going to do? Let him score? <laughs> what sort of man are you? Stand up to him. He'll respect you, but... But then, he is the boss. You'll make him look stupid. You hold it against you. You can kiss that promotion goodbye. What the... Hey, isn't that the new kid from finance? That's what you should have done! It was a test! But wait, there's still time. For career advice worth listening to and thousands of jobs, visit monster.co.uk. Sloans don't need employment agencies. So, what goes on then? So, um, if you again personalise this to the leadership teams you're part of, the leaders you've observed around the boardroom, do you buy this idea that there are voices going on? And if so, how do leaders get past that? What behaviour do they exhibit in the boardroom? What are the kind of indications that they're fearful around this topic. What, what, what behaviours have you experienced in the boardroom uh, when confronted with this kind of anxiety? Yeah. So there, are set, there are a different set of players. It's not a uniform crowd to which you are presenting or trying to not, not, not please but convince that you're doing the right thing. Yeah, so, so there's a, it's a, a diverse cast of characters, and they'll have a different, different view of this, and they'll see this through a different lens. What are some of the sayings that kill creativity in a boardroom? Where's the data, data to back it up? Where's the data? So, yeah, absolutely. Show me the evidence. The always done it this way. We've always done it this way, yeah. Failure culture. Failure culture. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, if this is such a great idea, show me somebody else who's done it. Oh, they're doing that. We'll do that too. That's really smart thinking differently, yeah. <laughs> Anything else? What other sayings? Outside our core competencies. That's right. Outside our core competencies. And, and um, there's, there's also this kind of idea of leaders are, in my experience, they start getting very clever around the chat becomes terribly clever discourse which is a clue and an indication that they are masking some kind of terror of going somewhere untested, where there is no data, where you can't back it up. So the kind of um, the work I try to do in helping leaders get back to reconnect with their creativity starts with this piece of advice that I um, heard a really smart-ass Sloan ask Professor Rob Goffey at the capstone in 2003. And he said, go on then, Professor Goffey, we've, we've invested... I think at the time, and Linda, Linda will correct me, $40,000 and the opportunity cost of a year out doing the Sloan. So just before we go back in the real world, you just give us your last piece of advice, could you? Unlike everybody's hanging on this, this is a big moment. <laughs> and many of you will know, he says, be yourself more with skill. That's, that's the route to pretty much everything. That is my, I, I've adopted it as a man. Be yourself more with skill. And indeed, you have to be yourself more with skill if you're going to allow yourself to be creative as a leader of an organisation. And there are a number of ways to do this. First of all, you do have to get rid of these voices in your head. So if you're anxious like me and you have this permanent noise going on in your head that sounds like Woody Allen, you know, you're in front of the Sloans, they've already tripped Julian up on some point or other, they're bound to come at you. You know, if you run these kind of narratives in your head, you're not going to have your best ideas, nor are your people. So you have to encourage them to get round that anxiety. You have to get a life. I was with a, a bunch of um, very, very impressive leaders from a big luxury conglomerate for three days talking about how they could unleash their creativity and growth. And they were talking about the fact that when they visit the trade, it's a, it's a leading wine and spirits company, they visit the trade maybe twice a year. 
some of them. And it's like, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, this is your category. You cannot be serious that you're going to have your best ideas and think through novel ideas whilst you're at your desk. So as leaders, we just have to let people out uh, to get a life. And uh, to do that, you have to encourage people to get back to that kind of naive curiosity that we felt at school, which isn't always easy, particularly as we get more senior. The kind of experience of curiosity can feel a bit like this. I, uh, I do apolo I apologise to Jim actually because Jim has seen that movie. We've now got creativity on the on the kind of uh, as an elective programme, uh, which wasn't the case in 2003. So I think you might have seen that movie. You knew what was coming. It still made you wince. Um, that curiosity is vital. I, I believe that creativity of all forms, not simply the kind of the brand creativity or the creativity that you delegate to creative partners but the creativity that exists in a leadership team across the board throughout the business that's going to allow people to think differently is nothing more than one's curiosity applied. It's your ability to be really nosy, really inquisitive, and then to use that in some way. And in fact, commercial innovation is nothing more than one's creativity applied. So if you want a creative culture and an innovative culture, you have to breed a really curious culture. And that's not something that most businesses are comfortable investing in and giving people permission to do. There's something else, too, about um, the need to encourage a great degree of positivity. Uh, and I'm going to demonstrate this just before you go into lunch. Now that Nora has kind of demonstrated your willingness to play and participate, uh, I, I will take a little risk because we're talking about risk-taking and innovation. But just to kind of give you a, a takeaway for when you go back home to improve your personal life, uh, those of you not familiar with this work by the Gottman, uh, uh, the Gottman couple, they looked at 40,000 couples across the world. They're a marriage guidance kind of uh, consultancy. Uh, and uh, they looked at 40,000 couples to work out the magic number that can predict if you're heading for the divorce court. And it's based on this idea that when we feed back to each other as partners, uh, we get into the habit of being negative. It's just the way we are. And, and this is true in business. We get used to the idea of saying, yes, but that won't work. I've seen that before. All the kind of sayings you came up with are ways of stopping your partner moving, moving on. And uh, they predicted that for every one piece of negative feedback you give each other, you better give yourself five positive. Any less than that, and you're in trouble. <coughs> So if you want to get your phones out now, you're more than welcome uh, to just, darling, I, I'm at the Sloan thing. I just want you to know you're brilliant. Uh, you're brilliant. Um, it's, it's terribly important. There's something else too, fundamentally, and there is no, there's no way around this, to be more creative and innovative, to indulge yourself in curiosity as a leader when there's so much at stake for many of you who are accountable for big decisions, you have to have a go. And this uh, was a piece of advice that Dominic Holder gave us when we were on our, his elective about leading strategic transformation. He pulled out this gorgeous piece of poetry from T.S. Eliot that talks about daring. And indeed, there will be time to wonder, do I dare and do I dare? Do I dare disturb the universe? And when it comes to this transition between the old norm and the new norm, frankly, there is nothing to it other than to give it a go and to dare. Um, which I suppose brings me to the baboons. Uh, and simply to say that, um, based on my experience at Sloan at least, um, I decided to have more of a dare, and rather than have most of my boldest ideas and conversations in my head, it was to get out there and dare to do something different. So you'll see, those of you who've now got a free copy of my book, 
And for the Americans, I'm sorry, but it is an American edition I've given them. Uh, and the Americans will also see on page 18 there is a typo. Uh, I call the Oakland Athletics a basketball team, not a baseball team. I know, I know, I know. That's why you've got that edition, because the second print corrected it. So. <laughs> There's also something else, of course, I've learned today. Julian Birkinshaw's written 12 books. Is he giving his away? No. no. I've written one. <laughs> mad, 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 mad. Um, the fundamental idea of the book is that, at least for me personally, I was a far better and became a much better contributor to leadership as a number two or as a beta. Uh, a conciliary than I was as an alpha. I left the Sloan thinking I was going to be an even bigger, bolder, better chief executive. I did it for three years. I was okay. I was miserable. And so I stepped aside, became a deputy. Julia mentioned there are two deputies at London Business School. There was only one deputy at uh, such and such. <laughs> but I deputised for nobody. It was a fake title. I was deputy chairman on the board. But was there a forum in which I deputised? Absolutely not. So, um, but I, I had three people working with me, that was it, instead of 1,800, and I was gloriously happy, still am, I took those people out recently and we're now on our own as a baboon troop. And the reason I mention it in the context of creativity is because um, the alpha baboons, and many of you I know probably are the alpha baboons, the people basically making the final decisions, ultimately accountable to shareholders, you've started your own business, you're running your own empires, and at the very least, you've got teams of people looking up to you as functional leaders, geographic leaders. You'll be playing the kind of the alpha in the room. We're also, all of us, probably answering to some other higher being. So we're also playing, uh, as I call it in the book, a conciliary, some role as a C. So there are A's and C's. Why, therefore, did I call this thing beta baboon? Because, according to the field biologists, beta baboons in the baboon troop are happier and less stressed than the alpha baboons. <laughs> so I called my company Beta Baboon. I then took my team on a, a little field trip to be curious to Devon Zoo to go and look at the baboons. And I proudly told the head of mammals why I called the company Beta Baboons. And he said, yeah, but as you describe what you're looking to do, actually, if you observe it, you are more like the female baboons than the beta baboons. <laughs> It was too late. I printed the business cards. I'm not going back. Um, the reason it's so important is because, in, again, in my, in my work, what I observe is alpha baboons, it's not that they can't be creative. Of course they can. It's not that they can't think differently. They are expected to think differently to create the vision of the enterprise. So it's just that the work they do typically is urgent, it's important, it's crisis management often of their own making, but it is crisis management. <laughs> and the beaters, the beaters both by motivation and personality and time, have the ability to foster an environment in which they can help other people have their best ideas. It's not that they're not accountable, they are. I felt deep accountability as, as a C, as a conciliary uh, at Saatchi, and still do. But it, there's a more private pleasure in, in creating an environment where other people can have their best ideas, where you become more of a creative coach, where you allow people their own independent thinking, which is, of course, the great gift, where you're able to yell with your silence as opposed to fill the airwaves with, this is my idea, this is my idea, where you don't always sell the idea you've had. So I believe it is time for more beta baboon behaviour in business, uh, particularly when it comes to thinking differently and thinking about how we move from old norm to new norm. The new norm in the boardroom for me will be a boardroom <laughs> full of baboons, but where there is more beta baboon behaviour or female baboon behaviour, where creativity is genuinely a core part of what leaders believe they have to do every day. It's a leadership imperative. On that note, we are 15 minutes from lunch. I'd love to take some questions before I set you one little exercise to make uh, lunch an even more joyous and creative affair than it would otherwise have been. So any questions, any conversation? Yes. Hi, I'm one of the Americans. Um, 
I want to ask you a question about getting the incentives right. Yes. So you're basically advocating more creativity at senior levels, but yes. you know that uh, the people that manage creatives always make significantly more than the creatives do themselves. So how do you balance it out where you're basically incentivizing creativity yeah. in a way that encourages upper management to basically that are not well compensated in most organizations. Yeah, so, so the question here is um, around incentives and the notion that those that we look to to create tend to be less well rewarded than the managers of those uh, people. And um, in the work I did actually for Julian Birkinshaw on his course around parenting corporate advantage, read the article, it's brilliant, um, I looked at the most creative companies and those that elevate creativity, actually there is no disparity of pay. It's seen to be uh, a, an equally important role. So if you look, for example, at the great companies like Pixar, you will find you know, the most rewarded people are, are those who take prime responsibility for innovating and having the ideas. Um, I worry a lot and had this issue uh, in an organization I was consulting to where the creative director, in this instance, it was a science institution, so the head of research, the research director, who in my view is like the most critical person in the organization, um, was on the organogram, was reporting through to the chief executive. And as a trustee, I fought very hard to make sure that on the organogram, actually, there was, and it's a partnership. If the artistic director, the creative director, the, the plant, the shaper of all great ideas, isn't of prime importance in the organization. That says a lot about the organization's uh, lack of attachment to the need to innovate. Um, and last thought is that um, I don't believe it's any one person's role, any one discipline's role. I think that the change is it's part of everybody's uh, job and it should therefore form part of everybody's incentives. Yeah. Practical question. <laughs> How would you test uh, someone's cr creative skills at the interview? Yeah. Well, I think creative skills at the interview, I think if you go to the heart of what I'm suggesting, you look for clues about how curious they are, how open-minded they are, whether they have the humility to say, I don't know, and mean it sincerely. All these things are behaviours that underpin a truly creative mind in a sense of someone who's keen to see problems where they exist, and fathom a way around it. So I would go to the kind of behavioral qualities that underpin it, as opposed to, here's a pair of scissors, can you find a hundred different uses for it? You know, which is gonna tell you nothing. I yes. have a question here. Anyone here? Regarding creativity, I'm one of those out in New York. One thing that I've noticed recently, uh, because I'm advising a lot of large companies, the board of directors of these companies, especially banks, right? Majority homogeneous, white males, been yep. in the company 10, 15 years, think yep. alike, went to the same schools, mostly the same schools we went to. Yes. How do you create an environment where the boardroom has no blacks, no minority, no, not, no, no, no women, no gays, because it's all white males from the burbs of New Jersey, yep. all think alike, come from the same schools? Yeah. It's, it's a w and it's absolutely critical to cast a diverse set of people around, around a ta any table. Um, at Saatchi, and I learned this post Sloan, when I joined Sloan, I took over responsibility for Europe, Middle East and Africa. I was given Toyota to look at. And I had an issue with some of the work that we were producing. And we were getting punished by, by Toyota all the time. And when I went for some coaching with my boss, uh, he asked me what I was doing to bring more creative thinking to Toyota. And I, you know, after some really lame answers, he said, I just don't understand you. You're so risk averse. Why have you not flown in our most creative minds from Africa, New Zealand, Latin America, the US, Russia, to cast a random set of people to crack this problem? And I, I said, but it's going to cost a fortune. He said, it's going to cost a fortune if you lose the business. You better get these guys over here. And he taught me that you, by producing very quickly random sets of people to, 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 to uh, attack a problem, you get incredible things. On the elective I teach, I bring live challenges into the class, and I put people in teams they've never worked with before, highly diverse, 
and within literally nine hours they're producing ideas that the clients are kind of you know keen to adopt. Um, so it's, it's, it's critical. Diversity and its impact on creativity, there's loads of academic literature on it. The key is to sort it out, act on it, dare to do it. Yeah. In terms of the titles people are given, have you seen how they manifest into the kind of behaviours exhibit when you have people with titled chief? Yes. I mean, they're trying to behave as alphas, and, yeah. your, and your proposal was, how do you get them to be more creative and more team players? Yeah. Have you seen a shift in, in titles and, and their behavior? I, I, so a plug for the introduction, I have a real go at all the titles. Uh, the chief risk officer, you know, the chief visionary officer, uh, who sounds like he works for an optician, you know. I mean, there's, there's all sorts of, we've all got a chief. It's ridiculous, and it does it. Just like I said, if you call somebody a creative, then they start to behave badly. If you call someone a chief, you're basically saying, go on then, permission to be an alpha, with all the excessive kind of stereotypically bad behavior that that invokes. So you need a democracy of ideas, a diverse cast of conciliary around you, that's gonna foster more creativity. We have one over here, yeah. Yeah, so it, it's all well and good to try and create more diversity, and I think that's critical. Um, and it's also a lot easier to create a creative culture from the start in, in a startup or a small yep. company. But when you have a company that, that's a large organization, how do you actually foster creativity in those that are not used to doing it? And how do you change the culture? Okay. There's some wonderful work by um, Teresa Amabile. It's quite old, um, at least the original article. It's a Harvard Business Review uh, article from 1999. And it's called Creativity Killers. And, and for a brilliant, in my view, exposition of how to foster a creative environment and how to overcome things that inhibit our creativity, um, there are three things you have to focus on. First of all, you have to have, according to Amabile, expertise. And it's amazing to me that most of the companies I work with kind of leave their expertise aside when they want to start innovating and creating new solutions. You know, R&D, amazing expertise. Pharmaceutical companies, you know, whoever you are, there is a basic expertise that's part of being able to spot a problem, solve a problem. There is then motivation. And the motivation, she says, is both intrinsic and extrinsic. Critically important, intrinsic. What's the nature of the challenge? Am I going to be working with people I, I find really kind of provocative? Um, what's the time? Do I have budget? All those kind of things. You can foster an environment where the intrinsic motivation is high. She says, by the way, money doesn't feature in intrinsic, um, which when I showed that to my boss, he said, that's great. That's why we don't have to pay people quite so much money. Um, the truth is absence of money can demotivate, so you just have to be careful about that. The big thing in the middle is, is creative thinking skills, and that's like anything. That's a muscle you have to work. And there is no kind of uh, ownership of, of how you produce the kind of drills that allow people to improve their skills in my classes, I take people through some really simple techniques and tools to a very rigorous framework because the most creative, innovative thinking always happens within the boundaries that are well-defined, within some constraints. Somebody mentioned IDEO. You know, there is a great design thinking process that you can adopt. And then you just practice like, like anything, like you practice a musical instrument. On which note, with five minutes to go, I'm going to give you one practice to take into lunch. So um, I'm going to call time on this. You're welcome to do this uh, live on the other side of the world if you want. All you need to do here is to stand up opposite one partner, not too close, it's nothing romantic, it's certainly not as embarrassing as the, uh, the last exercise. I just need you working in pairs on this, so stand up, maybe find someone you don't know. If there's any odd one out, Alison will play odd one out. Okay? Okay, that was the easy bit. That was the simple bit. Here's the game. One of you, one of you owns a hair salon, not a beautician. One of you owns a hair salon, and the other needs a haircut. Okay, so just make that decision. Okay, right. One of you. One of you owns a hair salon, a hairdressing salon, the other needs a haircut. Here's the game. The person who ne needs the haircut says to the salon owner, good morning, I need a haircut. 
And the person who owns the salon has to reply with the two words, yes, but. Yes, but we're closed. If you need the haircut, yes, but as you can see, it's urgent. Yes, but, and you have a conversation, and all the rule of the game is is to say yes, but, as you open your response to each other. Clear? <laughs> Off you go. How many people got a haircut? Just take a, a quick look around. Okay, for the people watching in, you can't see, but two hands went up, okay? The Sloan's, as ever, disobeying the instruction. Right, now, switch roles, switch roles, and if you were the owner, you now uh, need the haircut, and if you needed the haircut, you now get to run the salon. You cannot say the words yes, but again in this game. You merely have to answer each other with the words yes and. Okay? Off you go. Good morning, I need a haircut. Yes, and. Yes, and. Yes, and. <laughs> time. Okay, for those over, pretty much everybody, keep your hand up if you've got more than a haircut. Okay, what did you get, what did you get here? Massage. Massage, pedicure, yes. A cup of tea, anything else? Which one? Yeah, a dry cleaner, he's going on holiday, anything else? Highlights. Highlights. This guy got highlights. Okay, um, please sit down. Um, it's uh, you uh, proved that you can create. That's a game from improvisational comedy. In improvisational comedy, yes, but is called a block. It can be very funny. You stop your partner taking the story on. As you saw, if you yes, but each other, which we do in boardrooms and businesses across the world. We stop people even meeting the challenge we set. Get a haircut, virtually nobody met the task. You say yes and, you meet the task, and you take the story to unexpected places. Nobody thought of massages, pedicures, highlights, holidays, and everything else you got when I asked you to get a haircut. So as you go into lunch, as you go back to your boardrooms and, and indulge in some baboonery, learn from the improv and yes and each other. By the way, I played that game with the senior leadership team, the commissioner of the London's Metropolitan Police. And uh, they really got into it. 
uh, until one of the assistant commissioners, when he was playing Yes And, he just looked at his partner and went, Yes And, you're under arrest. <laughs> so, uh, um, thank you very much uh, for a lovely session. It's back to lunch.